forward this and that way those who are not able to see it or if you see something that you want to go back and review you'll be able to see it online so within 24 hours i'll have it up on uh the website uh, i can put it on a link on facebook but it'll be actually through youtube so if you wanted to search for the name of this class or melissa kinsey you would be able to find it as well so uh, i'm eric garten i'm the executive director at wallfield and it's my pleasure to be here today we're so excited uh using this what is new to us technology and new to a lot of folks i would imagine but i'll tell you what we'd, we'd never get this kind of attendance if we did it in person so that's kind of a nice thing we're all able to do this we have to take the look at the silver linings and uh, melissa and josh and i even uh, jody who i know is joining us here as well jody papandria she's our volunteer coordinator if anyone has side questions about being a volunteer, you can always message, uh, chat with Jody directly. Uh, if you haven't noticed that down on your little chat box, you can chat with anyone sort of behind the scenes. Nina is also with us, Eric. Uh, and Nina is on there too, awesome, perfect. Well, hey, Melissa, uh, take it away. Everybody, Melissa is our environmental educator at Wellfield. She's also an avid birder. Uh, we oftentimes will go to Melissa for questions with birds. And that is one of the reasons that she's here to share it today because we haven't been able to share it out in the garden with everyone. So take it away, Melissa. Great. Thanks, Eric. And welcome, everybody. I'm really glad to see you. Uh, would rather be seeing you in the garden where we were walking and looking at actual birds today because they're definitely out there. I had my window open earlier and it got really cold, but uh, the bird songs are beautiful out today. So I hope you've had a chance to go out and listen. Um, I also... Did you bring your binoculars? Just kidding, you don't really have to have them for class, but we will be talking about gear and things that might be helpful if you're just getting started in the world of birding. And uh, I am gonna switch over here and share my screen because I love taking birding pictures and so I'm gonna share that with you. So one second here. And I should be able to get to this. on technology don't fail us today uh, it's coming hold on too many screens open okay here it is well i think it's coming all right Should do it. Awesome. Yeah, you can see it. Cool. All right. Can everybody see that? I hope. All right. Eric, you're seeing it? Yep. Okay. So today we're talking about birds and why they matter. And it's always kind of fun to do a talk about birds because some people don't ever give them a thought. Other people like me are bird enthusiasts. I would never say I'm an expert on anything. Um, I know a little bit about a lot of things, especially birds, but I'm an expert on absolutely nothing. If you've known me for a while, you've heard me say that before. I'm also a business person and I teach at Goshen College and some at Indiana University. And as such, I like to work from agendas so you kind of see what it is that we're going to uh, be addressing today. The real goal is just talking about birding in your backyard. And since we all are being told to stay home now, which is an unusual thing for all of us, uh, I hear from people all the time saying, I've lived in this house 15, 20 years, and now I see I have a, a pileated woodpecker this year. I've never had one of those before. And I laugh because I'm sure that bird has been there before. They just haven't had the opportunity to be there to see the bird. So we're gonna talk about um, what is in your backyard, encourage you to take a walk around the neighborhood. If there's a little forest or a field nearby, walk there. As soon as the well field opens, come in and walk with us. Mary Kaufman Kennel leads great bird walks every week, and we will do some special bird walks as well. And uh, so we're gonna make birders out of everybody. Um, although I like to teach 
college classes, this is not a lecture, this is a conversation. And so I invite everybody to engage and get involved as much as possible with this technology. As Eric said, you can wave your hands or you can use the technology that you have in front of you to let Eric or Nina or Jody know and we will see the questions coming in. You can also pose your questions via chat. Um, I cannot see the chat while I'm in this screen, so Eric will let me know uh, if there are questions. As we go through, I'm gonna ask you some questions, sometimes to identify a bird. And so you can use chat to send your response. The first one who responds correctly, everybody else can stop so we don't get like 40 responses, but uh, that will be kind of fun because there are a lot of photos on here. So we're gonna be defining uh, what is a, bird watcher versus what is a birder. We're gonna look at how we identify birds. What do birds eat? And how do we attract specific birds to our yards and to our habitats? And we often get asked for specific birds like hummingbirds, bluebirds, songbirds, mockingbirds, woodpeckers. So we'll talk about all of those. We're gonna look at where do birds nest and how do you create habitat for that? and why do they migrate, and what else might you see while you're birding. And we're gonna look a, lot, a little bit then as we wrap it up at habitats and our environment and how our changing environment is impacting the birds. And this first little bird that we have on our screen right here, I hope everybody recognizes what type of bird it is, maybe not the specific species of bird. So if you can send that through and uh, we will go from there. Pretty soon you should be able to identify that bird very quickly and tell me all kinds of details about it. So I'm gonna start this by posting some of my favorite pictures that I have taken while birding. This little guy was part of a, a set of triplets. There were three little brothers walking along the trail in front of me one day. So I just followed them closely as I could, kept taking pictures and they walked along side by side just like three little old men bouncing along on the trail. They never went, ventured off into the woods. But this little guy kept turning around and looking at me. He was very curious about me. Finally, he just stopped and he walked into the woods and he kind of propped himself up on that stick and let me walk this close to him. And I took pictures for quite a while, really till he got bored. Then he turned around and followed his brothers on into the woods. So there is so much to see. And I know all of us in this part of the country, perhaps not Eric's relatives out west and others joining us from parts unknown, but we see horses often because we're in Amish country. Horses wear blinders so that they don't see traffic and things coming at them side to side. But oftentimes we as people wear blinders too. We go through life like that. One thing that is a silver lining to being told to stay home on pandemic is I think people are taking the blinders off a little bit and letting, them enjoy, letting themselves enjoy being outside and exploring their own little habitats. And I see that as being a very good thing. If you've known me any time at all, you've heard me say, when you step outside, and I can hear Nancy and some others saying it with me, Karen and <laughs> Gina, when you step outside, look up, look down, and look all around. There is so much to see. And as a birder, especially this time of year, there are nests forming everywhere, little ducklings and all kinds of fledgling birds are gonna be coming soon. Um, these are three mother mallard ducks with their three uh, sets of ducklings. I love these pictures because they show the diversity of the habitats where these little guys might be born. So we're going to talk about where they might choose to have a nest and place their little ones. So are you a bird watcher or a birder? I love this quote. I'm going to read this for you. I didn't make this quote. This came from a book I read. And she said, the first time I went out to look at birds, I had no idea what I was doing. Not only did I show up without binoculars, but I didn't even know how to refer to the activity. When I met my birding group for the first time in a parking lot, I asked, are you all here to bird watch? No, we're here to bird. My first taxonomic faux pas. Well, I think as with all sports and all activities that people uh, really assert themselves with, there is a language that goes along with this. And so we are not just there to watch the birds and see what they do. 
We are there to observe and learn and listen and really participate in that, that world of birds. Um, so when you simply look out your window, you can see some pretty cool stuff. I would love to say, raise your hand and show me if you have seen the movie, The Big Year. I tend to not promote movies or anything technology wise, but as a beginning birder, this is such a great movie. It also is a fabulous book. Um, it's a story about real people and the craziness of doing a big year, which simply means that you are willing to travel the distance to see birds where they migrate. And uh, it's a very funny story. There's a goofy love story part of it. You can ignore that, but the birding scenery is classic and they go all over the world. They see beautiful places and it's really very accurate and true to the birds. They name the birds. They, I don't mean like Tom, Dick and Harry name them. I mean, they do name the birds in terms of their, their true bird identity. So if you're looking for a read while you're staying at home one of these nights, read the book or watch the movie and I think you will enjoy it and uh, perhaps learn some fun bird identities that we might not see in this part of the country. And as you can see, Jack Black, Steve Martin, and Owen Wilson, it's a pretty fun cast. So birds, what do we know at a glance about these two birds? And I wish we were all gathered together and you could shout out your responses. I've got chocolate here. I'd be glad to give a piece of deep dark chocolate to the winner, but you're not here, so I'll eat it myself. Um, but what do we know about these birds? Well, on the simplest level, we know the color. One is yellow and one is black and white with red. So we know something. So as we're identifying birds, and as we go out to become birders, we have to be able to call out what we're seeing so that those we're birding with can help us identify, and so that we can help others to see the birds that we spot. So in this case, <clears throat> we know that these are both pretty small birds. We can look at the size of their beak, they're tiny, and we can look at them in comparison to the budding leaf here, we can tell a little bit about the habitat of each, very different habitats. So pretty obviously, most people would say, I think that might be a woodpecker there on the left that's black and white with a dot of red, and they would be correct. And we're gonna look at a lot of woodpeckers here in a little bit, because we have in this part of the country, seven, actually sort of eight woodpeckers that we see on a regular basis, and they are a favorite around here, and I think most places, pretty unique birds. We can tell about the woodpecker's habitat because it is a probably a dead tree, which is great, it's a good place for a woodpecker. And we can see that there have already been insects in this tree, that's what all these little dots are. The insects have drilled into this tree and that's what this woodpecker is looking for. He wants to eat the insects. And so he's gonna peck a hole in that tree, maybe to put his nest box in there, or maybe just to go after those insects. The bark has already been stripped away from this tree, otherwise he would have tapped under that bark to get to his food. So in the yellow bird, case of the yellow bird, um, I can tell that it's springtime because the buds and the leaves are just coming on this little tree, uh, bright yellow green leaves, and he's fairly well camouflaged in that tree. And I know that warblers only pass through this part of the country primarily in the spring and then again in the fall. And this does happen to be a yellow warbler, pretty easy to identify. And the woodpecker is a downy woodpecker, which is the smallest of our woodpeckers. And remember the way this woodpecker looks in terms of the size of that little tiny beak. So I'm gonna talk about that more here coming up. So one of the important things about being a birder is that we like to keep records and know what we've seen. There are many ways that people use to keep their records. Uh, I am showing you here, I don't expect you to begin to read all these little names, but what that is, is actually an eight and a half by 11 sheet that you can print front and back. It's free to print it. You simply go to indianaaudubon.org and, or you can also just do a Google search for Indiana State Bird Checklist, and it will give you a variety of different lists. This is one I happen to like. Uh, this list is really cool. It shows all 420 species. Whoops, sorry about that. 
of birds that we can identify here in, uh, in a normal condition in Indiana. And it also will tell you things about the season when it's expected to be seen here, but it also gives you a place where you can mark it. So you may see it out of season, which would be kind of interesting. By seasons, they think of like spring being March to May, summer being June to July, fall being August to November, and winter being December through February. And it also tells you if the bird is a, a population that's in abundance, or if it is uh, common to be seen in the habitat, or if it's uncommon or perhaps even rare, and there are only a few sightings of it each season, and sometimes you'll get one that's an accidental bird, which I love that word, it's an accidental bird, meaning that it typically is not seen in that area at that season. And so you really wanna let people know if you have seen that bird, because that means that uh, you should definitely get a picture of it because birders like proof. And if you say you saw a specific bird in an area and you have a picture to prove it, then in all likelihood, if it's an accidental bird, a whole flock of other birders are gonna come around to try to take a look at that bird. We have done that on occasions and driven across the country to see birds that are in the wrong place, which I think is a really funny thing that birders do. So this is a good way to keep your records. Each time you go out, you can uh, just put a, a line beside the birds you see, that way, if you end up seeing six cardinals, you'll have six little dots or lines. And I like to mention if it's a male or a female, so I may have seen four males and two females, and I can note that too. And also, if there's any other information I wanna add, I put that on that sheet and then put it in a binder when I get back and I have the record. Another way to do it is to keep just a journal. And this is just a very common journal. It's um, sort of paperback but has a plastic coating so it can get wet and it can fit in your vest pocket or something like that. Love to do this for birding out my back window or in my neighborhood. I just write the date. I usually write the temperature and time when I go out as well as the high and low temperature of the day because climate definitely impacts and affects our birds. So I write um, anything unusual about that date and then same thing, I just write the names of the birds I see, how many I see, if I can tell male or female, or say it's an immature bird, I'll write that too. Immature meaning young, not like acting foolish. Uh, so those are great things. What I love about this is you can go back in prior years and see when your first of season birds are, which an FOS, first of season bird, um, one year ago at this point, the birds I would be looking for would be Baltimore Orioles. And so in 2019, I saw my first Baltimore Oriole on Tuesday, April the 23rd. Knowing that, last weekend, I put out my special food for the Baltimore Orioles. We're going to talk about that special food when we get to the food section, which is coming up. Um, I don't typically post pictures of myself. This is a picture of me with my dear friend, Dan Stolzfus, who was a wonderful birder and he was a great mentor and a great friend to me and to many other people in this area. These are his binoculars that I still use today that he left for me. And uh, finding a good mentor and a good friend to go birding with is, is a, a real gift. And I already look at some of my birding friends here at the well field as a real gift and we definitely enjoy going out and looking at our birds together. Eric, should I take a question here or should I keep going? We okay? Yeah, I think right now uh, nothing too good? pressing. Uh, Sandy had a one for later. Okay. She's got a, she's got a crazy red bird hitting uh, several windows going on four weeks and she's tried a lot but not really sure uh, what to do about that. That's an aggressive cardinal. You can bet it's a male and he's seeing his reflection in that window. Or you, Sandy, your windows are too clean. Put a little dirt on those windows. <laughs> That's there a good a, question. A suggestion uh, that Chris gave was maybe putting up some uh, sort of paper behind it so it was maybe not as reflective. Yeah. You can go online and Google search uh, raptor and you can, or just cut out of black uh, paper, 
cardboard or like uh, construction paper and cut the shape of a hawk or a, an owl or anything like that and just tape that up to your window. Some people also will put streamers across. Um, but in this case, it's not that he's hitting the window like flying into it. He's actually aggressively tapping. Uh, a friend of mine who lives just off of County Road 23, every year she has turkeys who come and aggressively go at their reflection in the basement windows. And she has some wonderful video of that. So I've had a house where the Eastern Bluebirds did it and the little tiny males would come and go all the way around the entire house rapping at the windows. And it's just one of those male testosterone things, you know. I don't know why males do the things they do. <laughs> Nina mentioned maybe hanging strips of foil too, something to get them Might to do it. Yeah. get away. But the main thing is they're going to do it until, especially if your windows are clean, really, that does make a difference. So, Thanks. okay. Thank you. So birding 101, this is a, a typical stance for birders. And there's something called a uh, warbler neck from where you stand looking up all the time and you get a stiff neck. And so then you'll see birders walking around like this because their neck hurts. But it's it's a good hurt. It's actually a lot of fun. And it's really fun to go with a group of people and turn around and see them all doing that. And that's all because one person says, hey, look, there's a bird up in that tree. And then everybody wants to try to identify it. And it's wonderful fun. So Birding 101, we learn to listen to observe, we're strengthening our memory. Everything you look at says um, birding is one of the best activities for uh, people who are trying to stay young as they retire and uh, do, do different adventures in their life. Great for memory, because you're learning an entirely new language, really. Um, you identify when and where you saw things and what were the conditions like at the time. And specifically, we look for what is unusual. And sometimes there will be a bird that you just can't identify because it doesn't look like it's supposed to. And that's really cool. I'll show you some pictures of birds like that. There's nothing wrong with them. It's just like us. Sometimes they look different. So birding identification is partly about sound. And birds can be identified by more than just visually looking at them. Sometimes uh, you can listen for them. And um, each species of birds has its own unique language, sound, song, and calls. And some birds can actually um, have hundreds of different songs that they will sing. An example of that is a cardinal. If you listen to cardinals and really pay attention, because cardinals are here year round and we see them in most neighborhoods, and they're pretty loud but they don't always sing the same song. So people will hear one song and they associate that with the cardinal. And then when they hear another sound, they don't associate it, but they see a cardinal and they find that confusing. But it's good that it is that way because then you learn um, some of their different songs. And birds are just like people. When they're excited, they have an excited call. When they're scared, they make a, a warning call. And so you can kind of start learning what's going in the woods, what's happening in the woods, just based on what is happening with those calls. And um, there are a lot of birds that you hear them long before you see them. And I was trying to play one for you here, but this is not going to cooperate right now. So I may play it for you again, or actually it'll probably play itself here in a minute and then everybody will jump and that's okay. Well, we'll try it again in a minute. Uh, woodpeckers can also be identified by the size, shape, and location of the holes that they make. And that's a fun thing too, to be able to walk up to a tree and say, I know what made this hole. And it's not just a woodpecker, but it is a specific type of woodpecker. So we're gonna look at some pictures of those. And this is the bird that you would have been hearing and you'll probably hear it here in a minute, which I think most people could identify, beautiful, very large, about a four foot tall and a, at least a four foot wingspan. And that is of course a sandhill crane. So we may still hear that yet. 
So I'm going to show just a couple of diagrams to help you learn the parts of a bird. Because as everybody knows what a bird looks like, but when you point to a bird and someone says, well, what, does it, what are you seeing? You want to be able to say what's distinctive about the bird. And with birds, it may be something about its eye. So in this case, this bird has an eye line. Kind of like Taylor Swift has eye liner and she has these little slanty things that come out of her eyes. Birds have beautiful ones naturally. And that's an example of what this is. Uh, there are also different parts of a bird. We're gonna look at some pictures of woodpeckers that have what we call a mustache or sideburns. And that helps us to identify males versus females, which is kind of cool. Everyone knows a cardinal because it has this tall tuft of feathers or a crest as it's called. They might have an eye ring. And that's not Irene like our friend who volunteers at the well field, it's eye ring. And it is actually just a circle around the eye. And we're gonna look at some ducks that have eye rings that make them very easy to identify. There are also some more detailed words that we don't always use, but when you get into more technical birding, you might look at some of these other defining um, this terminology to help you identify a bird. Oh, there it is. Now you recognize that sound. You hear that? That's that wonderful sandhill crane. And anytime you hear that, look up. And just because you hear it doesn't mean you're going to see them flying overhead because they're one of the few birds that fly so high that sometimes we hear them, but our eyes can't see that high. They're above clouds or we just can't see that high. So kind of an interesting thing to think about. Okay, so the next one is a similar thing, just another chart that shows you the parts of a bird to help you identify things like its belly, thigh. There are birds that are like a rough winged, um, no, a rough, rough legged hawk that has very heavy feathering all around its legs. And so you might be talking about different parts of that bird's legs. Um, the breast is important when identifying a bird. Some sparrows are known because they have a dark spot on its breast or its chest. Some will have um, spots or flicks all over their chest. So you might be talking about that. The throat, the chin. This, we know it as a beak, but it's also known as a bill. Both are correct when talking about birds. There's a forehead, a crown, the nap of its neck, and we'll talk about that a lot. Some birds have color that goes from the nap of its neck to the very end of its beak. And that's important, in, again, in identifying the sex of the bird. So more ideas about that. The rump, there are yellow rumped warblers. So knowing what area specifically that's talking about helps you know if you see a spot here, you know what to identify. Same here, crown, there are, um, Yellow crowned, what am I trying to say? Um, anyway, there are birds that have yellow or red on their heads, and I'm sure somebody's probably um, sharing that with us now in the chat because I can't remember the name of the bird right now. That's okay. Examples of bird identification I have two types of duck that we should see loads of them around this area. Sadly, the numbers are declining rapidly for many reasons. One reason is that we have two species of um, waterfowl here that are very aggressive. I say here, that means the Midwest. They're very aggressive and they chase away all of our native ducks. Those two species, everybody knows one, is Canada goose. Canada geese chase away all of our native ducks and they're aggressive. There is also a type of swan that most people are familiar with called a mute swan. Both of those came to the United States. The uh, mute swans were brought over from England because somebody moved here from England and thought they would be pretty in their duck pond. Well, unfortunately, they have acclimated very well and there are tons of them now. And they chase away these smaller, beautiful ducks. Um, so when we do see them, that's a really great thing and we're pretty excited about that. If you look at the difference between the two, I really like this set of pictures because people often ask, how do you tell a female mallard 
from a female wood duck. And when you see these pictures, I think you can tell it's very easy to tell them apart. If you're seeing a female wood duck, I think you will know. Her markings are, are very distinct. She has a white eye ring, and she is actually much smaller in size than the female mallard. Uh, the male mallard and wood duck are closer in size to each other, but the male wood duck still is smaller than the male mallard. They're all very beautiful ducks. The wood duck, and there's another one called a harlequin, that the, the coloring on them is so amazing. I always think they look like they've been painted. They're almost like a stained glass window. So distinctive, and the colors are just unbelievably vibrant. The mallard is kind of dark in this picture, but he actually is very beautiful too. His head is a jade green that when the sun hits it, it just sparkles like jewels. And there are some violet colored feathers back here too that are um, very, very pretty. Their ducklings look very similar. Even when I've seen them side by side, um, very similar. I don't have wood duck ducklings in this picture, obviously, but um, they're both just tiny little balls of downy fluff. So what's on the menu? Part of this class is to discuss the food, the type of seed or berries that birds like to eat, and how to attract specific birds to your neighborhood. So uh, first question is, what type of bird is this? If you know, you can send it over on the chat. Uh, it's a bird that we should be starting to see within the next two weeks, according to my year's worth of watching these birds. So when you're looking at attracting birds to your environment or your habitat in your yard, the first thing I say is just look at what's there. Do you have a water source anywhere nearby? Because birds and all animals need water. Has anybody answered the questionnaire? Oh, they're all over this one. Rose-breasted grosbeak. I knew it. We got birders out there, no doubt. Good job. Is it a male or a female? No doubt. It's the flashy yeah. one. Yeah. They know. It's the male. So in most, many and most bird species, the males are the flashy colors because they are the protectors. They're supposed to distract the prey so that the female stays with the nest and the young to protect. And it's a pretty good system. A little bit different than in the um, human species. So specific birds tend to be drawn to specific foods, but they all require water, both to drink and to bathe. Birds need water every day, and you'll see them taking very dramatic bird baths. So one thing I do encourage when people are getting started and very interested in birds is invest in a good bird bath. I have three of them around my house and they are in some ways more fun to watch than bird feeders. Um, I have a heated, one heated bird bath and I leave it out year round and I've had it for more than 15 years. So it's worth the investment. Uh, it wasn't terribly expensive, but I got one with a built-in heater, which cost, I don't know, I think it was $70 or something like that, which at the time I thought, man, that's a lot of money to pay the bird, but it actually has been well worth it. And I think you'll see in some of these pictures why. Um, birds will also take a dust bath. So you'll see them in the dirt scattering around doing the same um, maneuvers as they do in water because they have to get a little dust and then a little water to keep the balance of oils in their feathers in order to be able to fly. So it's, it's essential for them to have that. So if you don't have water feature in your yard, a creek or a pond or a lake or an ocean or a river, you might wanna think about getting a bird bath. And you also might look at what can you grow in your yard to attract birds. Um, most birds love seeds and berries. Some are omnivores where they also eat insects. And it's pretty easy to grow even if you just have a little uh, raised bed garden, if you don't want to dig up a, a big garden in your yard, a little patch of native prairie flowers, things like purple coneflower, sunflower, black-eyed Susans, they can attract many wonderful birds, including hummingbirds. Um, pinks and purples and reds will attract all kinds of, of birds. This list I'm going to make available at the 
um, visitor's cottage once we are open again, but I'll also try to post it somewhere on our website. This is just a list of what type of seed attracts certain types of birds. And it's not limited to this, just like some of us like broccoli and some of us don't, birds are the same way. Um, but there are things that birds should not eat, including the thing we've all fed to the ducks our entire life, which is day old bread. Don't feed them day old bread. It's not good for them and it can make them very sick. I'm guilty. When I was a kid, I did that and I don't do it anymore, but my neighbor does. Wish I could get her to stop. Um, but as you see here, the first thing on the list, it should say black oiled sunflower seed. And that is what I feed year round. You can get it, I buy it 50 pound bags. That's the cheapest way to get it. Um, you can buy much smaller bags too. But that is the seed that I have found attracts the most birds that I like. Now keep in mind, if you put out seed, what are you also going to have? I can hear you all saying it, even though I can't hear you saying it. You're going to have animals, so be prepared. No way around it. They live there, whether you feed them or not, they're finding food. It's just you're going to see them because you put the seed where you can see the birds, so you're going to see the squirrels and the chipmunks and the possums and the rabbits and the deer and everything else are gonna to come to eat your seed. So just enjoy them too. And uh, don't get upset and ask how to get rid of that groundhog or how to get rid of that uh, muskrat or whatever else it is that you don't seem to like because they're all great to have around. Um, so you um, can get this list and I think um, the, the one seed that I would say other than black oiled sunflower seed there is Niger seed, which is also known as finch seed, tiny, tiny seed that requires a special feeder to hold the seed in. That is good in some ways if you have a lot of squirrels because squirrels almost just don't fool with it. But you may have to attach the lid on because what a squirrel will do is take the whole feeder down and just pour all the seed out. Squirrels are very foxy. They figure things out. Um, but Niger seeds will attract tiny birds if you really like some of those um, smaller birds. The other thing for our Baltimore Orioles, now's the time to start putting out a little bowl of grape jelly and um, oranges. Take an orange, cut it in half, put the two pieces out there. You're going to see some of the most fun birds you've ever seen. Not just the Baltimore Orioles, but red-bellied woodpeckers, catbirds, and a lot of others will go after that orange and they get orange all over their beak. And it's quite fun to watch them. I call this picture the McMansion. These are Eastern bluebirds. Um, Kathy Mao, I'm, I can't see you, but I think you're out there somewhere, I hope. We've been talking about bluebirds and typically bluebirds are very picky and want a house with a very tiny hole so the other birds can't get in. This is a wood duck house. I think it's hilarious that this pair of bluebirds they're checking out this big McMansion to see if they want to live in it. The uh, male is down here patiently waiting while the female is looking in. And fortunately, they realized, no, that's a little too big for us. And so they moved on to something else. Fun to watch. Okay, so teeny tiny bird, tufted titmouse. They make wonderful songs and they have a very tiny, tiny beak. And yet, look at them go. They are picking up whole peanuts in the shell and watch what they do with it. So he picks it up. This is just a uh, board uh, on a deck. It's actually a crossbar bar that holds feeders. He picked up the shell off of here. They were actually out there for woodpeckers, but these little guys pick them up. They carry it over to a branch, sit on the branch, hold on to it. He is pounding this against the branch as a tool. And he breaks open the shell. Look at this, he's holding it with that tiny foot, holding that shell, there's still another peanut in there. He, going, he will eat that peanut, which is what, four times bigger than his beak? How is that even possible? And then he flips this thing and eats the other peanut. Is that cool or what? See, birds are amazing if you just watch them for a minute. But be sure you get peanuts for birds, not peanuts for people. These don't have salt and they don't have any other oil or bad stuff that people eat that we shouldn't eat either but we do but birds shouldn't so birds and animals love water so i was mentioning earlier this is my bird bath that i've had for a very long time 
So the Eastern bluebird, male comes, he gets in the water, ah, feels really good. He starts flipping himself around and he flips himself around a whole lot. And then he stops for a minute, keeps flipping. And then he gets really wild and flips his whole body. He wants to be completely wet because that's what his feathers need to maintain that oil balance that we were talking about. After he has flipped around for a while, he will stop and smile at you, which is a really nice thing to see. So I think that was worth 70 bucks 15 years ago to get that bird back. Northern Mockingbirds, another one of my favorites. You get the feeling I have a lot of favorites. I lived for a long time on a small farm and had the good fortune of having a mockingbird that came every year. Mockingbirds, to my knowledge, only sing when they're looking for a mate, which is why we hear so many bird songs in the spring. Uh, but they sing many songs. I'm gonna try to have better luck playing one of these for you. And Melissa, we're at the 15 minute mark, just be aware. 15 minutes after? About 15 minutes until, so it's uh, 145. Oh my gosh, I went way too fast. Time flies. Okay. Thank you. So when you hear a mockingbird, they, they sing and sing and sing, but they, that's one of many songs they sing because they will sing everybody else's songs. I brought my favorite birders, the, the big group we used to bird with had really um, avid, experienced birders. And I said, they wanted to come out and hear this mockingbird because you don't always get to see them. And as we're walking up, uh, my good friend Mary Martin says, well, you have a Carolina wren too. And I said, yes, I do have a Carolina wren, but what we're hearing is the mockingbird doing the Carolina wren, imitating the song of the Carolina wren. And it did it so well that it sounded just like the Carolina Wren, but it did it in this whole sing song it does of all the bird songs. It's, it's amazing to listen to those birds. So here's some examples of the things that they would like to eat. I'm gonna go really fast here. Um, my hope is that you guys are going to enjoy birds for little classes and we'll do some very specific to different species if this is something you're interested in. Um, the next one might be woodpeckers because there's some really cool stuff we could look at. It was a really good quick question. Uh, is yeah. that an app you're using for the bird sounds or is it a device of some sort? This is a little kid's device. I've got the apps, but it's too many things to keep going. I've got three screens here and my phone and my app and my books and my binoculars. So um, these are pretty handy and they're good to use with kids. You take this little card out and you can change the birds. It was before they had apps, probably. I don't know. Um, hummingbirds. You can get online, do a Google search for hummingbird migration, and it'll give you a map that shows you exactly where they are right now. They are in Indiana. I've not seen any up here yet. It's not too early to put your feeders out. Um, there's some crazy stories I can tell you about hummingbirds that we'll do if we get to do another bird class at some point. Keys with hummingbirds. Don't buy the food that they sell in the stores. It has food coloring in it. You do not want to add food coloring. All you need is one part sugar to four parts water, which obviously means one cup of sugar to four cups of water. It used to be they told us to boil the water. You don't have to do that anymore. You can just put it in like a clean glass jar with a lid, shake it until the key is that the sugar has to dissolve. The hot water can help it dissolve, but you don't have to use hot water. And then the key is clean it every day because uh, the sugar will ferment in the hot sun and it can make the birds very sick. You can refrigerate your extra mixture up to two weeks in the refrigerator. And keep in mind that you don't really need to fill the feeder full because you're gonna change it every day or at least every couple of days until it gets hot. Once it's hot, you really need to change it often. So you kind of gauge how much they can eat in a day and that's how much you want to try to put in. You may want to have several different feeders around your house. So identifying birds, I love this because, I don't know if I can see this, the people are in the way here. Um, if you know and want to identify these birds, please do so. Remember that woodpecker we looked at at the beginning that was a downy and it had that tiny little beak? Now we're looking at a much stronger, thicker, longer, heftier beak and the bird although it doesn't look big in this picture it is big so this bird is a hairy 
woodpecker. Whoops, sorry, I missed the page here. And it is across from a red-bellied woodpecker. You can also identify male and female. This happens to be a female. There's no red dot on the head here. This happens to be a female also. You can't see the red belly, but you will in the next picture. And her red goes from the nap of her neck just to the top of her head. The males, the red would continue on and go all the way to the very end here of its beak. So that's how you tell the difference. Uh, woodpeckers are really fun to learn because of that, because they are distinctly different. And these are just a few more examples of woodpeckers that I like to show the pileated or pileated, depending on where you're from in the country, is the largest one in the United States. And they tend to make their holes low down on the trees. You can see he's nearly on the ground and he'll work his way up. He's one that you can definitely identify by the shape of the hole. And I'm gonna show you the next picture will have more accurate um, holes. But this is a suet feeder that has been made to have the shape similar to what a pileated hole would look like. You can see they're more um, shaped sort of like this, sort of square-like, or no, rectangular. It's like rounded edges of a rectangle. These birds are, again, red bellies. You can see this one, this is the male. His red comes all the way down to his beak. And you can see his red belly there. This is a flicker. And flickers are so cool. They actually, if you catch just a glimpse of them, you see a flick of yellow that comes from under here, tails, wings. There's yellow and black, really pronounced contrasting colors. Uh, has a heart-shaped red on the back of the head. And as I think we'll see in some of the next pictures, they have um, a mustache or sideburns if they're a male, which is how we identify it. So here is the woodpecker hole. You can see the difference in this is more squared, not just a perfectly round hole. Most other woodpeckers, it's just round, and the size of the round hole helps you determine which woodpecker made the hole. So again, very cool. Um, there is something called an ivory-billed woodpecker that we might do a class on at some point. Not gonna find one around here. They haven't been seen since 1935, but there's a real mystery. So we might do a birding mystery class. And it's a very interesting stuff that we'll talk about another time. Migration, as we know, right now is the time that everything is migrating. And so robins, um, people think robins migrate, but do they? Nope, it's just that they don't sing in the winter time. Uh, they're not mating, they're not looking for mates, they're not calling out to each other, they're just trying to stay warm. They're here year round, but people always say, robins are the harbinger of spring because they start hearing them in the spring, but they've actually been with us. Warblers on the other hand, like the yellow warbler, they're here only passing through. They stop, they, they nest, and if we're lucky, we get to see them raise their young a little bit, but then they will move on. I talk about our changing environment. I'm curious how many of you recognize this? And also, when was the last time you saw one? We would only be seeing them in the summer, so we wouldn't have seen them since last summer. But I used to see them all the time in the summer. They're nighttime moths that come around and um, hang around streetlights. We're not seeing them much anymore, partly because of um, habitat reduction. It is very camouflaged. You can see moths are known for having eyes on their back, so they look kind of like a, an owl. Um, in case you're wondering, I can't see the chats, but this is a luna moth. They're a nighttime moth. Uh, fabulous to see. Habitats, uh, we may save some of this too for the end. If you were a duck, where would you put your nest? Um, some of you have, were here last year to see that a mother mallard put her eggs on the top of the green roof in the children's garden, which in the early spring when it was cool out, I thought, wow, what a great idea. We're going to get to watch this. But as it got really hot outside, not the best thing. It was too hot for her up there. So, Animals in your neighborhood. I just like to remind people that birding is more than just looking at birds. It's looking at everything. These are pictures I've taken when I've been out on bird walks and I can honestly say I enjoy seeing all of these things. Um, I have a wonderful possum in my backyard. If you're lucky enough to have one, don't ever ask, how can I get rid of that possum? They do you far more good than they do harm. They really don't hurt anything. 
uh, they are family uh, creatures. They raise their young and then their young will go off and they, they are good to have around. They eat a lot of mosquitoes and things you would rather not have. Uh, they also eat decomposing things that you really don't want to have. So we're going to skip the invasive species bit. A uh, few final bird pictures. Being observant when you walk outside, look up, down, and all around, even inside your Elkhart Truth box, that is a little screech owl hiding on a very cold, windy, snowy day. Um, Gary Haney in Goshen back in 2009, he reached in to get the paper and he thought, took a double take, wait, there's something in there. Fortunately, he had a camera with him and he got that picture, which I think is pretty amazing. Climate change is affecting things all around us. Um, some of the wonderful things we see, this is a common house sparrow right here in the center, pure white, it's called leucistic. It has all white feathers. It's not an albino. It's just a unique thing that happens in the animal kingdom. You can have a leucistic snake even, all white. So just fascinating to get to observe. Different kinds of gear. People use scopes a lot when we look for waterfowl out on the ponds. So that, whew, I think that, that, that was a really quick, a good question too that I think others will probably want to hear. And I know there's no answer. There's no one right answer. What are considerations when people are looking at binoculars to buy? Considerations. You know, we might do a whole class on that, seriously, yeah. because, yeah. Uh, because they, they are the one kind of expensive thing that you really do have to have. It's not a lot of fun to go birding without them. Right. Uh, you can share them, have one pair for several people, pass back and forth. Um, but there are, like, uh, some that, st that will hold your hand steady, help to steady if you're a little shaky. There are some that are better if you wear glasses or if you wear bifocals, some that are um, great for kids starting out that are, you can drop them and they don't break. And so there are a lot of factors to consider. There's a place in South Bend that's a camera store. I can't think of the first name of it. I'm sure some of you know, we'll find that out. But um, that's where I bought a, my newer pair of binoculars and they're really helpful at fitting you to the right type of binocular. So that's a good question. Jeans, jeans camera. Thank you, jeans camera. That's it. I knew somebody that's would Nancy know. And Nancy and Randy. Yes. I knew Nancy would know. Yes, that's good. <laughs> um, so life is all about shared experiences and birding is a great way to share with others. Maybe it's your grandkids, maybe it's your neighbor two doors down like Jim Rickoff, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> but it's a way of getting outside together, walking around your neighborhood looking up, down, and all around, and really seeing great things. Any other questions in there or comments? There, uh, there was a question. Oh, a really good suggestion, I thought, on feeders. Someone said that when you put Oriole feeders out, you might, if you have other wildlife like raccoons, they may take those at night. So that might be one to bring back in. That's a really good point. One thing that I've learned about raccoons and squirrels both, they steal everything. So I've started using um, clips like you use when you're doing rock climbing. Probably have one here somewhere. And I clip those and then kind of tie it onto the shepherd's hook or whatever it is that you're attaching your feeder to. And that just helps um, hold it on. And so I have not been losing so many. They used to carry everything away. So, and, and I have to say, if you're afraid of wildlife, I've got some great stories to tell about birding in Colorado where um, the, uh, the bears will come and take your feeders away, which is a fun thing to watch. That's funny. Other questions or? Uh, no, were there, I don't think I missed anyone. If, if anyone wants to unmute, if there was something that I missed or that you wanted to add really quickly, I will also tell you as we learn our technology, a, an unintended consequence that actually worked out pretty well is you'll notice we have a bunch, uh, several people that have just added, and those are our staff members who were coming on for a four o'clock meeting. And so, or excuse me, a two well, o'clock meeting. I say I talked way too long. And, and so <laughs> we, had, we, had clearly, uh, we had clearly just done it in the same Zoom room. So uh, after this is over, you're welcome to stay for our staff meeting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Sandy, and thanks everybody for coming. And uh, if you have requests of special you. birds, let us know. 
we'll we'll try to do a little class on them. I, I would also say to keep in mind, we will share this as a video. And also a question about the handouts, Melissa. If, if there were simple things that we were able to put into files, we, because you registered, we've got everyone's email addresses. We could actually just send those out to you specifically. Uh, we could try to do that, but we'll make sure we share this information uh, get it out there one way or the other. That was the that was the point of these classes. Uh, that when we're you'll see a, a more that we're working on as a team this week, and you'll see some from gardening, like I mentioned with Josh. I'm going to do a membership orientation, kind of an overview of where we're at with construction at Wellfield, and uh, try to encourage you to either renew or join as members. And if you know people who might be considering joining Wellfield. It's a great time to do that. You know, we're gonna be open when we're able to do so. And uh, we would encourage it. And more than ever, uh, certainly we always appreciate our members, but this year we're gonna, we're gonna need your help. Uh, so we thank everybody for renewing. And by all means too, if you'd like to make a donation, there's actually a, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with section 2204 of the CARES Act. They are giving a, a special incentive for those who would wish to give to a charitable organization. It is a 300 for individuals, 600 if you're filing jointly, but it is a, a tax credit sort of above the line, uh, which is new this year. It was part of the CARES Act. So check with your, your tax professional on that. But I could think of a couple organizations that uh, maybe one in particular that could use your support. And Melissa, I, I want to thank you for doing this today. Sorry it was a bit of a rush. <laughs> An hour goes by so quickly when there's so many cool things to see and do. But do continue to watch on Facebook. Those of you who are volunteers who get direct emails from Jody, uh, you can, you can, you'll continue to get those as we offer more things. And we'll shoot out on email for, for an e-newsletter too once we get our little roster of things put together through the rest of uh, April at least. That's what we're scheduling right now. And we're gonna see what happens as we, as uh, CDC regulations, state executive orders on stay at home and county travel watches, whether they expire, extend, we will keep you all up to date on that. So I wanna thank everyone sincerely for your support. What you're doing right now is literally helping us further our mission. And those uh, staff that have joined us just in these last few minutes, that's what they're all here for. We're all here because we love what we're doing. And this is a great way for us to engage. It is driving us just as much crazy as it is you all being under stay at home orders because we're not able to share the garden in person that we normally do and we, we love it. So I'll let you signal sign off Melissa and uh, staff hang out and uh, everyone else enjoy the rest of your day. Hey everybody, thanks a lot. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. If it was this much fun with pictures, think how much fun it really is outside. <laughs>